be up on the Twitter. Are we going live? Are we live? We are live. We are live. Welcome to the show, gentlemen and ladies. I have. How would you like to be introduced? <laughs> oh, everyone calls me Ed. I'm Ed. Ed Dutton. Hello. How are you doing, everybody? Uh, Hi. Ed Dutton. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm Abdurrahman, Abu American, Craig, whatever you, whatever's easiest. Um, let me just go ahead and do the Twitter thing here. I'm like, why is my Twitter acting goofy all of a sudden? There we go. So just make sure everybody knows that we, oh, it's live. It's, it's, it's live. It did it itself. So yes, we, um, we don't really have an agenda, but, um, we wanted to talk about just in general. We, I mean, I had listed, I had like Islam, the West, what else did I have listed? You, you mentioned intelligence. So, um, man, let's just jump right in. Well, I, me I mentioned, I mentioned, uh, I mentioned breeding. So the yeah. thing, the thing that really interests me uh, about religion is the fact that it's, it's basically um, there's this idea that uh, religion is weakly negatively associated with intelligence, and that uh, people who this stereotype, I suppose, and and particularly in our Western uh, secular um, sort of replacement religion of wokeism, traditional religiosity is is mocked. And it's, it's not mocked with Islam because they're a bit scared of the Muslims, but it's mocked with everybody else. Um, and, and I think that it's, it's important to understand that religion is basically an adaptation. It has all the signs of adaptation. It's, so it's, it's, it's seen in all cultures. It's associated genetically with mental health. It's associated with uh, physical health. It's associated with uh, fertility. Uh, there are certain parts of the brain which, when stimulated with magnets, make you both more religious and more uh, oriented. Um, it, it, is, it is an instinct which hits in at times of stress and particularly of mortality salience. It is significantly genetic, depending on the measure of it, between 0.2 and 0.7 heritable. So something like being a fundamentalist or having a religious experience is about 0.7 heritable, which means almost 40% of the variance is to do genes sorry there's this feedback i'm getting i'm trying to move some speakers around um, um and so and and so it, and it's associated with other uh, pro adaptive traits such as being pro-social and so on so it's it's adaptive and among at the moment western people aren't breeding uh, at the moment we're getting to a point where we're below replacement fertility among western people but the people who are among western people above above replacement fertility are religious people and conservatives and those two traits are highly genetic uh, and among more intelligent western people among the people that are more intelligent i, I look at this actually in a book that i had out recently um oh, where is it now it's over here <clears throat> the um the the, the 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 past is a future country the coming conservative demographic revolution and we okay. find that among the more intelligent the big predictor of breeding is that you are religious is that you are conservative religious and that you are a conservative and the big predictor of infertility that you don't have children is that you are an atheist um, and, and that you are a liberal. And so um, what this means is that society should basically flip back towards conservatism. And this really interests me, particularly in a context in which, well, what kind of religion would it flip back towards? Because Christianity has been mocked, it has been ridiculed, you know. And you have all these people, if they become interested in Christianity, they're, they're, to, they're attracted to Orthodox Christianity, maybe in the West, even mm -hmm. though it comes from the East. It's not really part of our culture. And you have this strong movement uh, a century ago or so of people being attracted, people that were traditionalists, uh, like René Guénon and people like this, um, being highly attracted to um, Islam, saying, well, Islam hasn't been mocked. Islam hasn't lost its, its power almost. Um, and, and, and so there's still a connection to the past all the way back. Uh, and, and so you have them moving towards that. So that's one of the reasons why it particularly interests me. Nice. Let me ask you a question. Have you read um, J.D. Unwin's Sex and Culture? I have, yes. Indeed, there is a, there is a new edition of J.D. Unwin's Sex and Culture being published uh, later this year by Imperium Press. And I wrote the foreword to it. And I, I wrote, a, I wrote a, a biography of J.D. Unwin, the first one that's ever been written. I, I wouldn't. In this day and age, I would have never thought that they would republish that book. No, but it's a it's a fascinating book. Yeah, very. Well, what fascinated it's, it for you? What, why did you find it fascinating? I mean, basically the same conclusions that the further away the societies move away from rigid, rigid religiosity, they go more towards hedonistic type lifestyles. The faster the collapse comes, or basically just collapse comes in. 
I mean, it's mm. it's almost, you know what it seems like to me? I don't know if you can connect it, but in my mind, I've connected it. It's almost like the Great Mouse Utopia and J.D. Unwin's book are, it's almost like you can tie the two together. So when you look at like these two, like the book and then the experiment, I mean, the conclusions are pretty... Well, I don't, know, I don't know if you've read any of, any of my stuff. I, not only have I written the foreword to that book, but I've done a number of papers on J.D. Unwin's Mouse Utopia. Okay. Um, and, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very interesting for people that aren't familiar with it. What he did was he took, a load of, he took a load of mice, removed all the disease and conditions of predation and anything like that, and basically he recreated a post-industrial society, i.e. a society where the child mortality rate in 1800 was about 50%. And the child mortality rate now is 1%. So basically no, no child mortality, no selection out of sickness, of, of mental and physical sickness. And those two things tend to correlate. No selection out of those two things. And so, and so um, uh, what, what do you see? What do you see in the mice? You see that gradually you see an explosion in population, which is just what we saw in the 19th century. And then gradually you start to see weird behavior. The, the, the male mice behave like females, the beautiful ones. Yes. And they, 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 no interest in sex. They just groom each other all day long. The female mice behave like males and start fighting and killing each other and whatever. Yes. Um, and eventually, none of them want to have children at all. And they all just die yeah. out. Yeah, and it's the end. It's, it's, it's mutational meltdown. Yeah. Um, really, what you're seeing in some ways is a very clear parallel to what's going on now, which is that as, we, as, as, as the mutations are not washed out, the, the, the physical mutations build up, but these parallel mental mutations, because the mind is about 84% of the genome. So if you've got a malfunctioning body, you sure as damn it got a malfunctioning mind. It's a massive target of mutation. So you, and you get all and all of these bizarre things and they all build up. I did a paper a few years ago about, oh, about uh, five years ago now called The Mutant Says in His Heart There Is No God. And um, uh, what, what we showed was that, uh, was that um, uh, uh, being irreligious correlates with all kinds of markers of having high mutational load, basically, of being mentally and physically sick, uh, which it does. So, so um, uh, yeah, that, that, is a, that, that, is a, that is a fascinating um, insight into what might be happening in modern culture. And he's frozen. Have I frozen? Someone's gone offline. I, I don't know if I'm online and, and should be entertaining you and saying something, or if he's online. It's it's hard to tell. It would it would be good if someone in the chat could indicate uh, what's going on, whether it's my internet that's a problem or his. Uh, it's hard to tell now. Could someone in the chat? I oh, yeah, hello, hello, resident poet. I'll keep busking, right? So it's 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 like my interviewee, Abu American, has has gone off. So, um, all right. So I've got an audience who are mostly Muslim. Uh, I just me now, resident poet. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, thank you very much for letting me know that. So I'm I'm, I'm preaching now to an audience that are mostly Muslim, uh, and uh, uh, I, I'm straightening at the deep end here. After eight minutes, and I have to, I have to work out what to say. Uh, this is this is a bit difficult. I did. I'm I'm not sure what to uh, what to suggest really. But I was just going to say that the uh, obviously the, it it throws up all of these unusual people, all of these people that deviate from what we were selected for under harsh Darwinian conditions, and what we were basically selected for was to be group oriented. Um, that is to say, to be quite high in the moral foundations of obedience to authority of sanctity, i.e. the revulsion against that which is bad for the group at the individual and the general level, and therefore high in disgust, uh, uh, um, and uh, and uh, in-group loyalty and obedience to authority, and therefore of conservatism, because those are highly conservative values, and also religiosity, which is itself highly adaptive, as I said, is associated with conservatism. And so as the Darwinian conditions collapse, what we're going to see is a deviation 
mainly towards the left, uh, away from that, away from religiosity and away from uh, conservatism and therefore in the direction of liberalism and atheism. And we would expect those traits to be associated with uh, poor genes, with, with high mutational load. And that is indeed the case. Uh, people that are, cons are, cons are liberal compared to people that are conservative are, are physically less symmetrical faces. They are more likely to be left-handed, which betokens a more asymmetrical brain. Um, they, they are physically short uh, they um, uh, get over disease less easily. Sorry, I've just been pre. I've just been talking to your audience because you went off. <laughs> yeah, this is the first I've never had the internet crash. It just completely, it completely conked out. It was the weirdest thing. Never happened before. Are you um, in, are you in a part of America that has bad internet? <laughs> no, no. I have I have cable in Germany. Oh, in <laughs> Germany, oh. oh. Oh, I, can't, I, don't, I don't know. But I, I was just saying, with regard to what you were saying about mouse utopia, the, the idea is that if you take away these evolutionary pressures, what we're basically selecting for under harsh conditions, and that's why these things correlate, are player triply related, they correlate with health, they correlate genetically with health, um, is, is religiosity and conservatism. And if you take away those selection pressures, then you just get this deviation from that. Um, into um, into people that are atheists, into people that are liberals, that are selfish, that are individualists, that are concerned with um, with with, it, with anything but the good of the group. Because what religiosity tends to do, as far as I can see, is take that which is good for the group. Groups are under group selection; they're battling each other, mm -hmm. and it takes that which and that which wins is that which is high in positive and negative ethnocentrism. All else being equal, positive ethnocentrism internally cooperative, negative ethnocentrism repel the outsider. And what yeah. religion seems to do is it tends to take that which elevates those traits, which is good in group selection terms, and it just it sanctifies, it makes them into the will of God. And so if you look at the Old Testament, which, of course, is inherited by uh, the, the Quran, um, then almost everything it does um, can be understood in those kinds of terms. It, 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 is, it is as group selection manifesto. And it seems to me that what... Islam is doing in complete contrast to the West. Um, if you go through the kind of thing which someone like Saeed Qutub, is that how you pronounce his name? Q U T B. Yeah, right. Saeed Qutub. Yeah, right. And, and what he what he wrote about America, he basically said, what you have in America is this: you have a debauchery, you have a sexual license where people can do what sexually whatever they like. And mm -hmm. the argument of J.D. Unwin is that you should have sexual repression because if you repress your sexuality, then the energy that you would put into sex is put into things that are group oriented, like mm -hmm. inventing stuff um, and doing stuff that's good for the group and promoting religion and whatever. But no, no, that's that that's all gone. Um, you have no divine authority. There's no belief in superior meaning or metaphysics. And so therefore, no one has any reason to do anything. So they just become selfish and degenerate. You have obsession with money and materialism because without a belief in something greater, that's what happens. So you have out of control usury, basically. Um, this, this creates a situation where society is run by just rich criminals um, uh, and everything's through wealth. Uh, uh, and you have this trade in sex and whatever, and that's your society. Yet life has no meaning, and people feel terrible. And that yeah. was basically his argument. You know, you mentioned something that I found very interesting um, about uh, in-group preference. You know, there was a book I read by. Um, well, actually, it's an anonymous book, an anonymous conservative wrote this book called R slash K Selection Theory. Mm. And, and are you familiar with it? Yes, I've read it. Yeah. This guy's read everything. This is great. It's like you're like one of the only people I know that's read the books that I've read. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so that actually makes some that I, I like I like how that plays into there with really religiosity and religion, uh, with the R slash K selection that R selected people. And if those of you who don't know, I mean I don't know how much time we would have taken to explaining R slash K selection theory, but let's just say that R selected people, if we accept that there are two groups of people with two different uh, strategies, if you will, within the, the, the human type, the human genome, if that's the right term to use. R selected people have no in-group preference and K selected people have a very strong in-group preference, meaning um, they are more, uh, uh, what's the word? They, they're more like standoffish with outsiders, you know, as opposed to R selected people, they just don't care. Uh, it, it probably needs more explanation than that, but 
There well, you go. It's, a, it's, a, it's a spectrum, isn't it? And it, it's it's if you're if you're in an easy, unstable ecology, live fast, die young, then yeah. you need to pass on your genes as quickly as possible. So you, you invest all your energy in sex, uh, and you invest nothing in nurture, and you just hope that luck does the rest, basically. And yeah. because it's a dangerous, unstable ecology, you've got to be violent, you've got to be impulsive, you've got to be untrusted. There's no point trusting anybody. There's no point creating bonds because the person could be wiped out and never be paid back. So you end up with these people that are very low in trust, uh, very low in cooperation, very impulsive, very nasty, very selfish, yeah. utterly about their own power and so forth, Machiavellian, narcissists. Oh, sure. They basically like modern-day liberals. I mean, yeah. individuals. Exactly. I, I want to make it that. They're basically modern-day liberals because our selected like people, they don't really care about borders either. You know, And this is one of the things I put in the title is immigration. It's one of the things that I actually I, – I don't know why. <laughs> the older I get, the, the stronger the, the feeling against immigration comes mm -hmm. out even within my in-group. My in-group, I admit, my in-group is our Muslim. I absolutely have a strong love and proclivity for Muslims. But even within my own in-group, I don't want Muslims coming here. It's just something about it. That's is your, is your in-group, to, to what extent is your in-group being um, sub-Saharan African, though, or, or even from somewhere more specific I, than I, that? I literally have no real connection uh, to sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I mean, I've, I've married some sub-Saharan sub African Muslims, but I, I have no real connection to anyone. Um, most of my close circle are prior U.S. military revert Muslims. It's so you're, Af you're African-American? African -American. Where, where, yeah. where, where are you from in, in, in America? I was born in California, but Texas is home. My mother is actually from the United Kingdom. She, she's from Trinidad, but she's a British citizen. Okay, so it's all just, it's West Africans, it's Tahomey. It's the, 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 that's, I, that's I would, yeah, we, we can assume safely West Africa. And you don't, you, don't, you, you, you don't feel if confronted with uh, uh, black Muslims as opposed to South Asian Muslims, more of an affinity to the black Muslims, no? No, actually my, my um, it's, pretty, it's pretty diverse, my connection. We, we, actually my in-group circle is that it is really people who have a strong proclivity towards like a, a specific uh, 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 belief system within Islam. So I'm a Salafi Muslim. So my in-group is generally only Salafi Muslims. I don't really deal with anyone other than them. You know, so that group is mixed. There's there's whites, mostly whites. Most of my most of my 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 closest friends are white. Um, then there are some African Americans, and then when it comes to the UK, there's a there's a slight and small mix. Uh, Southeast Asians uh, and yeah, and some Somalis, so they yeah. eat Africans. Okay, so so it's a it's a I mean the the the, the so it's 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 conservative Islam then basically. But yeah, but the, the the unifying point for all of us is the unified idea of this Salafia in Islam, this conservative Islam. Yes, yeah, that is yeah. the unifying point. Um, okay. Um, so, so, um, but with reference to what you were saying, the, the opposite of the R strategy is K strategy. And this is the idea that once the environment becomes harsh mm -hmm. and stable, then the carrying capacity for the species is reached. And so then the species members start competing against each other. Mm -hmm. And then they have to become strongly adapted to the environment. And how do they compete against each other? Well, one of the things they do, you, you need, you slow down, you take energy away from, if you, if you don't, if you have lots of kids and invest nothing in them, they could all just die. So you have fewer children, you have fewer sexual partners, you invest more energy in nurturing them, um, you have a longer childhood and generally slow down so you can learn more about your environment, you become more adapted to your environment, because your environment's harsher and more difficult because you're competing, you become more intelligent, you, you, you are more likely to, to survive if you can be in groups, so you become more group-oriented, more cooperative, more agreeable, uh, more uh, conscientious, um, and then and and so and this is all promoted as the as, as the will of God. And even with something like patriarchy, which tends to be, you see it of course in the Old Testament, you see it in all of these religions. What is patriarchy? The woman is saying to the man, the, the man is saying to the woman, "I want sex," and the woman is saying to the man, "Fine, if you want sex, then I want you to invest in me and my offspring because I'm more likely to survive, and so are my offspring if you invest resources in me. So I want a high status man, and I want you to invest in me." So then the man says, OK, if you want me to invest in you, I want to be sure it's my offspring. So 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 I get to control your sexuality. And from and from there, you start to get patriarchy and you start to get methods of control of. Uh, and then also in terms of what you say about unwin, it's quite interesting because how can you get men to cooperate with each other if the men are really concerned that the women are sleeping around? They're not going to cooperate. They're going to be fighting each other. Yeah, so you're going to have low positive ethnocentrism. Give them patriarchy, 
then they can be sure that their women aren't sleeping around and then they'll cooperate with each other and then they'll do better in the battle of group selection. So patriarchy gets selected for and the men select women that are submissive to the patriarchy. Um, and, and then it gets interesting because then you take patriarchy away and a lot of these uh, le leftist women are anti-patriarchal, individualists, whatever, take patriarchy away and they're in a kind of evolutionary mismatch of women. They're sort of, well, what do I do? And then, what, 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 my dad isn't telling them what to do. My brother's not telling them what to do. And they do crazy things. Yes. And there's a guy, there's a Greek uh, uh, psychologist called Benereus Apostolo. And he's mm -hmm. written a book on this. Uh, what's the name of the, the title? I can't remember. I look at it in my own book, which is Feminism and the Fall of the West, anyway. But um, the, uh, what's the name of the book? Uh, something, something under a system of social choice. Anyway, and, and uh, so, yeah, so then you, you'll get women that will do maladaptive things. because they're So that's what another thing that uh, distinguishes, I think, Islam in the West from what's going on in Europe. There's a constant questioning of patriarchy. And um, a lot of women are unhappy because they are evolved to patriarchy. They are literally adapted over a long time, particularly if they're conservative, particularly if they're cons conservative sort of women, um, to, to want to be under a patriarchal system, and they're not. And if you look at the research on, let's say, the Amish, they have sky high levels of subjective happiness. And um, this is because they're living in an evolutionary match. This is the, and that's another point which Kutub made, which is interesting. He basically said that... that, that um, society is meant to be in a certain way he didn't put it in evolutionary terms but okay. he said it's meant to be in a certain way and if people are in that kind of a society i.e where there is a religion of unity which follows the traditional rules of of the the old testament then they so, are happy take them away and they're not so let, let's swing this into modern day in, in all of this into the modern world that we're living in right now when we look at the west in light of all of this information I have my own conclusions. What are your conclusions of what the future holds for the West in specific? Well, in terms of the breeding patterns, what's happening is that among the more intelligent, if you, it's important to, when people, people have this idea, this breed them out idea. You see it promoted a lot among a sort of right wing American uh, podcast. They say, well, but basically religious people are having more, more children than non-religious people. There's a genetic component to religiosity, to conservatism. So we're going to breed them out. And it, it doesn't work like that. Change does not come from below. Change comes from the middle or even from the top. Okay. So what, what we tend to imitate the elites. We're pack animals and we naturally imitate the elite. It's called uh, Yank concession syndrome or trickle effect or whatever. Um, elite mores trickle down the society. So yes. uh, you go back to the 60s, you had a new up and coming elite that were saying things like you shouldn't be racist. You shouldn't be homophobic. You shouldn't be sexist. Yeah. Um, and those were not the views of ordinary British people. And they've gradually trickled down the society such that even quite working class British people now adopt those views. Yeah. So the change comes from the elite. So the question is, what's happening among the elite? That's the question. Okay. And if you, and if you look at the, the data on who's breeding, which we look at in the path of the future country, then what you find, who's breeding? A number of different people. Firstly, low IQ people. Uh, 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 there is a weak correlation between, negative correlation between IQ and how many children you have. We know it's genetic. The um, prevalence of alleles associated with intelligence is decreasing across time among Western native populations. So we're getting stupider at about the rate of a point, one IQ point per decade. And we've lost... We lost about 15 IQ points based on reaction time data between 1880 and the year 2000, which is the difference between a science professor and a high school science teacher. So the first thing's happening is stupid. The second thing that's, that's, that's happening, obviously, is we're getting more non-white. People who are non-white, uh, uh, particularly people who are South Asian or, and uh, Arab in Western countries, have significantly higher fertility. There's a heritability even to this. So that's increasing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the next thing. So what I would suggest is what you always get in the winter of civilization, which is that uh, basically structures, complex structures collapse. More and more things go wrong. A, because we're getting stupider. B, because we balkanize into separate little sub kingdoms, like we just like we did last time around, just like we did last time around with the fall of Rome. You have this large empire breaks up, multi-ethnic, low IQ, low trust, low cooperation, can't be held together, breaks up. The third thing that's happening among the elite is interesting, which is among the top quartile of IQ specifically, the big sterilizer, 
is liberalism and atheism. And the big fertilizer is conservatism and particularly conservative religiosity. So what's happening is basically the left, the, the left elite are becoming stupider and the right wing elite are becoming more intelligent. Okay. And, and you can see this in real time. Look at the deputy leader of the Labour Party in the UK, Angela Rayner. That's why I've called this the Rayner effect. It's utterly stupid woman. And, that, and, that, and that's almost the best the left can offer. So what you're going to see is the percolation upwards into elite positions over the coming 20 or 30 years as society collapses into disorder and chaos and breaks up into warring ethnic microcosms and all of the things. If you've, have you read The Fate of Empires by, by John Glubb? I have it, but I haven't read it yet. Oh, you must read it, my dear fellow. It's, it's incredible. It's, um, and he, he noticed it, the same things again and again in ancient Greece, in a, ancient Rome, in ancient Baghdad. It's exactly the same in the winter. You, uh, the heroes are always the same. They change from being military men to being pop stars and singers. Um, yes. You, you get materialism. Uh, oh, the religion is questioned. Very short. Our, Aristoc very short book, yeah. Aristocracy oh, is questioned. Yeah. Homosexuality becomes acceptable because the religion is questioned and the religion represses homosexuality. Like Unwin represses homosexuality, represses feminism, represses, uh, promotes patriarchy, uh, promotes ethnocentrism. All that comes apart. You get mass immigration. You get balkanization. It, uh, you, it, it, all, it, all, and, the, and the elites stop breeding. And this is commented on in Rome. It's commented on in Greece. It's commented on in Baghdad. Yeah, yeah. People stop. It's, it's exactly the same. Um, and so that's what I would predict, that you'll get this you'll get this collapse basically of civilization but you'll get a retreat into a kind of neo-byzantium maybe we could call it or a, a neo-cordoba maybe from an islamic perspective um, you know you'll you'll, you'll, you'll you'll get these enclaves of civilization where things hold out um and 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 one of them will be the eventual holder people forget that um in 1070 a ship full of 300 300 ships of anglo-saxon notables left england and went to byzantium Intelligent people were leaving the third world chaos of the West for Byzantium and also for Cordoba. And I, I look at this, I think, somewhere in, in my book on Islam, there was a number of uh, Saxon um, intellectuals that made their way from England to Cordoba because they, or Cordoba basically held out a kind of Roman level of civilization. Mm -hmm. But eventually, Cordoba itself collapsed. Um, and Byzantium was all that was left. So that's what it I would like say. The migration to Dubai. Happen again, uh, like it did last time. So what were you going to say? I said, it sounds like the eastward migration of a lot of people who are intelligent to Dubai. That's what it sounds like it's happening right now. There's a lot of people heading that way. I'm not really sure if this yeah. is true, But I mean, a lot of people who are looking for like safety, security, you know, stability in terms of predictability. To where it's like you know you can get up in the morning you can go out in the street you're not going to get robbed you're not going to kill there's not going to be chaos there's not going to be filth there's not going to be you know drug use or people fentanyl addicts everywhere whatever else they move to dubai and then they continue their business there they continue to flourish there uh, i'm seeing a lot of that right now a matter of fact i have a friend uh mitchell uh, abu diab he, he's a, a a white revert to islam and uh we were talking about this on the show that there's like a a, a very large migration of westerners to Dubai right now. We were trying to actually like, why is this happening? It sounds- Yeah, I'm doing a lot of research on this at the moment. I'm, I've got a paper that's about to be published on the migration from California to Texas. Yeah. And, that, and, that, and that's very clear. And I show in the paper, it's eugenic. It's intelligent Californians getting the hell out of California. And I was in California a few weeks ago. Oh. And, 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 and just being there on, just in somewhere like Berkeley, which is one of the richest cities in California, I can see exactly why. Um, you know, it, 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 it was wonderful being in my hotel in Berkeley, this place where I couldn't smell human excrement and piss. And then the moment you leave the hotel, the moment you leave the hotel, I mean, in, on the street in front of the hotel, it hits you. Um, and then I went to Hyde Street in San Francisco. And uh, that was just, I mean, I just couldn't believe what I was confronted with. And then get out of there. And go to places like I don't know parts of Pennsylvania, or Long Island, parts of Long Island, you know, and you've, you've you've got civilization. So there's migrations there. I suspect Eastern Europe. I think parts of Eastern Europe are going to be the big thing because I wonder if the problem with Dubai is as things get more complicated and and as we become stupider, we will be less able to do things we used to be able to do. We will make more and more mistakes, and 
complex systems will break down more often and more easily, as happened in the UK the other week with the whole aeroplane system breaking down. Yeah, I watched your video on that. Crazy, right? I mean, bonkers. That, that, just stupid little mistakes. And in yeah. low IQ societies, more and more of that happens. And the problem is that to sustain a high-end lifestyle in a desert is is a much more difficult thing to do and requires far more complex systems that are far more difficult to sustain as we get stupider than it is to sustain a high-end lifestyle in you know Hungary or Poland. So I'm a little bit concerned that you, it would be it would be a bit fragile to sustain it in a desert. Um, and that's why I wonder how if, if ultimately the, the the Dubai as a place where civilization flourishes might be rather transient. But could we theoretically argue that the opposite would take place? If we have like a high IQ exodus to these regions, then maybe it won't be permanent, but it would definitely be prolonged. Uh, to a point where there would be a recovery or a reset? Yeah, I think you, that's a very good point. But I, I, if, that, if that were the case, then presumably they'd have to some, they'd have to find some way. Because even among, I got a paper out recently where we found like conservatives are becoming stupider, oh. just not as fast as liberals. So there's, 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 there's a dysgenic effect for everybody. It's just not, there are a few groups where they are in positive eugenic fertility, in eugenic fertility, i.e. the group selects for IQ. One was the American, was white Mormons. So they're positively selecting for fertility. Um, I haven't got any data that indicates any Muslim groups are selecting for fertility. I'm an honorary researcher at a university in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And I do, I, and I've done research with them on this. And as far as I can see, based on the data we've got, even Saudi Arabia is in dysgenic fertility. It's selecting against IQ, which makes sense because it's industrialized. Um, something seems to happen when people become too rich. There's this evidence. It happens in Rome. The rich just stop having kids. Mm -hmm. It happened in Greece. It happened in Baghdad. It's like with our evolutionary match, which brings out our instincts, including our instincts to want children is death lots of death mm. and there's research which has found that if you are primed with mortality salience i.e you're made to think about death this makes you want to have children it makes you think children are less expensive than you'd otherwise think they are it makes you want to name children after yourself um and indeed if you are confronted with actual death um you know with war it makes you want to have children so that implies that that's our match and it, it brings out that instinct. And if we're in an evolutionary mismatch, that instinct is not brought out. And so it's people that are less in, that are less environmentally sensitive that have children. And there's some evidence that people that are intelligent are more environmentally sensitive. So they, they are more requiring of a precise evolutionary match to put them on the adaptive path of life. Whereas people that are less intelligent, they're more our strategies, they're, they're more instinctive. People that are case strategists, they're evolved to very specific niches. Take them out of that niche, they're messed up. People that are strategists, they're evolved in everywhere. So it's just it, it's just it, it's it's just instinct. It's just built into them. So low IQ people are higher in instinct, so they they have children and wherever it doesn't matter. People that are highly intelligent are less instinctive. The instincts aren't brought out. And so what that selects for then is people that for whatever reason are highly instinctively nativist. Yes. So it's it, 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 uh, natalist. Sorry, it's a it's a it's a new um, uh, a new crucible of evolution is is uh, is modern culture, which is selecting for people that are instinctively desirous to have children, i.e., religious people and conservatives, um, and everyone else that's, that would otherwise have children uh, if they were confronted, surrounded by death and whatever. They're not doing it. They're residing from the gene pool, um, and so it, you'd have to, with regard to what you were saying, you'd have to have something that would induce that. You'd either have to have a eugenic society. Okay. selected for intelligence mm -hmm. deliberately somehow or you'd have to have um a society which somehow made people want to have children even if they were highly intelligent because they were thinking about death all the time interesting what do you think about this real quick i, I do i do want to go back to the topic but uh what do you think of yahya's comment he's not gonna lie intelligence is overrated look at covid <laughs> it's, it's kind of a fair point when you look at the reaction of covid you know, when we look at like Western society and the reaction, the global reaction to the to the uh, we're gonna call it a pandemic. I don't know what your stance is on the pandemic. I call it the scamdemic. Um, and when we look at you look at the evidence that existed, uh, even at its peak, uh, showing that 
in general, we were re reacting or overreacting or reacting or acting in a way which is contrary to when I say contrary to what's beneficial, look at Sweden. Sweden had almost no knock lockdowns or whatever else, and their and their excess deaths didn't really they're actually lower than most of the countries that locked down quite hard. So is would you say there's a connection there in terms of intelligence being overrated by looking at the reaction that society had to something like COVID? Or well, I don't know. What do you think? Well, um, it's an interesting question. It, it strikes me that two things occur to me about that. One is that the, what we would do in a pandemic was drawn up in the 50s or 60s. In Britain, I mean, it was. Okay. When, when people were, uh, were more intelligent than they are now, um, on average, by a number of points, um, and when also people were higher in group-oriented values. So we have these five moral foundations. We are pack animals, so we are and we have to beat other packs. So we are high in in-group loyalty, obedience to authority, and sanctity versus disgust, because what sanctity tends to do is tends to sanctify that which is healthy for the group and the individual, and taboo that which is unhealthy for the group and the individual, like things that are disease, disease that make you sick or whatever. Um, and then you have because we must ascend the hierarchy of the pack, because in prehistory it was well, there is there was an association between uh, socioeconomic status and fertility until relatively recently. Um, we are also high in equality, which means that you that's another foundation we have, which makes you, you want you want at least equal to everybody else. So that's one foundation. And we are high in harm avoidance because this involves ultimately avoiding harm to ourselves. So we have these five moral foundations. Conservatives are about the same in all five. Liberals are only interested in the individualized, individualizing foundations of equality and harm avoidance. And so things and so therefore there's asymmetric empathy uh, with things tending to move in a liberal direction until the liberals create such chaos and such dysphoria and such an evolutionary mismatch that you get a conservative shift back. Now, it strikes me that when these things were drawn up, we were A, more intelligent, and intelligence makes you more rational, more, more, uh, uh, more future-oriented, more, more sort of harshly logical, autistic, if you like, um, and, um, and, and also we were more group-oriented. And so therefore we said to the population in Britain as well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to achieve herd immunity. Yeah. And when this was drawn up in the 50s, eugenics was still something that was quite popular among the ruling class. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and they understood. Humans are a herd. I've got a new book out, by the way, called Breeding the Human Herd, Eugenics, Dysgenics and the Future of the Species, mm. um, in which it's over here in this direction. <clears throat> Yes, you see, this is my, my, my book on this topic, you see. And and um, and so that's and so that I, I talk about COVID in that. And so that's what we decided we'd do. Now the problem was that since then, because of this build-up of mutants and whatever that are individualists and so forth, we've shifted over into being an individually oriented society. And then we've had there's been a tipping point of maybe 20% has been reached in the 60s. We tip over to individualism, and then you have runaway individualism. Because then sort of intelligence is associated with conformity. People that are intelligent, they look around the world and they notice what the dominant set of values are and they understand the social benefits of conforming to them. So they imbibe those values and, and they force themselves to believe them and then they competitively signal them. So you then get runaway individualism. And that's what's happened. And so they were confronted with this logical, reasonable plan and they were like, no, no. Oh, 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 the lack of equality. Oh, the harm. Oh, some people might die. Oh, old people might die. Oh, you're saying we're like animals. Oh, my God, I am literally Grandma. killing our brain. Yes, it's um, killing and, and you have this irrational reaction. <laughs> okay. Now, let me personalize this conversation a bit. Uh, let me ask you a, question, a personal question. Do you have any children? Yes, I do. Okay. May I ask how many? Two. Two. Okay. I have I have ten children. <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna save the West, you know, uh not personally. But um when we have the discussion of R slash K selection theory, society, intelligence, and all these types of things, you know, um it's it's my personal opinion that um parental investment is more important than anything else, obviously. Um I guess some people would call that, what do they call this? Uh, nurture versus nature. Although I disagree with that. You know, I, I do think it's some of both. Uh, but 
how do I say this? Do you have ten kids? Are you, are you ten kids all by one wife, or do you have sort of multiple no, wives? No, they're not. They're not. Most are by one wife. I had I was with one wife for twenty four years. I, I I have multiple wives. Being a Muslim, uh, I was with one wife for twenty four years. We had six children together, and then um, after we divorced, I went back out to get married again, and uh, far too late that the entire matrimonial world slash dating, whatever you want to call it, had changed significantly. And my my reproductive model of success that I used in the previous relationship was no longer valid. And so uh, I had a period where I was getting married and divorced like quite rapidly. And in that I, I, had, uh, I had children with one woman and then the women that I have children with now, I'm still married to those two. So it's a total of four women. Two of the women I'm still together with, I have children with. My ex, uh, we have a very good relationship, making sure that our children turn out as best as possible. And one, I have a rocky relationship, but we do communicate for the benefit of our daughter. So, yeah, that mm -hmm. was, yeah. I, I wrote actually a book about this, um, The Betting Guide for Women, uh, so that guys uh, know what to look out for in terms of negative attributes of women to avoid in the 21st century. Because there are a lot of red flags that are noticeable if you're paying attention to them. So what are and, they? Well, what are these red flags? Oh man, there's a lot. <laughs> uh, one of the first things I say is the relationship with her parents. What is what is her model of reproductive success? Does she have a two parent household? Does a woman know how to actually live in a household peacefully with a man? If she doesn't have that model in her life, she's going to be guessing. She's going to be taking uh, her examples from society. She's going to be taking it from social media. From presumably, her presumably, presumably, none of your own children, because you're divorced, don't live in a two parent household. No, absolutely. That's that's that is a problem. But I do maintain contact with the children. You know, we do have an idea. They do have a model like um, my children. They visit. So they do have an idea of what it looks like to live in a stable household because I do have stable households now. So those children that visit and come stay with me, which they do regularly, they can see what it looks like to be raised in a or to be in a in a in a relationship that is healthy. You see what I mean? Presumably the problem is if the parents get divorced very young, then the parent, the child has never known a stable household, really. That, yeah, I would say, yeah, that could be correct. That could be correct. But this is why it's important, uh, you know, if you have a breakup, to break up at least peacefully, you know, um, so that for the benefit of the child. Absolutely, in my opinion. Uh, I think it's unrealistic nowadays, unfortunately, that people are going to have like relatively stable marriages, which is why I wrote the book in the first place. So that was one of the things. Look at the the, the household. Two was look at um, social media usage, because uh, I equate for women social. What is social media to women is adult education or uh, adult entertainment for men. I hold that the two are similar. That they have a similar effect. Men who use adult entertainment, they're using it to have an artificial access to multiple female partners the spray and pray the spray and pray reproductive model this sort of like it plays in there somehow and with women since what's important to them is attention and validation they turn to social media for that oh i see that's that's an interesting point yeah and it's been found i've got a paper that's about to come out on this actually that men are higher in internet addiction Basically, because men are higher in all kinds of addiction, men are just more have more addictive personalities. They have lower conscientiousness, yeah. they have lower impulse control. They get more addicted to things. But women are specifically higher in social media addiction, yes. because you you are in a situation where, as as a woman, you are evolved to basically be in a harem. That in, that's in prehistory the situation, and 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 you have to find allo parents who will help you bring up your children, and you have to share personal information with them in order to very strongly bond with them so you can trust them with your children and so therefore the whole social life and very subtly getting on with people is much more important to women than men and so you can see how how they for girls for example will boys will pretend to be ill to get off school yeah girls will be less inclined to do that because they'll think oh, if, I, if, I, if i'm off school for a day i'll go back and the social dynamics of things might have changed you know someone might try to poach my friend so, so it's so it's a, it's a it's a very different world. It's a highly sociable, uh, uh, yeah. It's a highly social oriented uh, um, universe. And also, I suppose I was reading the other day an article which which argued that um, traditionally the man stays in the community in humans, stays where he's from, and mm -hmm. the woman goes somewhere else. She marries out of the family, you know, go out of the village, 
and go somewhere else. And indeed, in prehistory, you would have a situation where men would come in from other villages, kill all the men in the village and take the women. Mm. Which may be why women are better at learning foreign languages than men, because they evolved to a situation where they get taken away, you know, into into another culture. But it yeah. certainly means they're evolved to be around friends to a greater extent than relatives. They're evolved to be around people that are genetically different, dissimilar from them, uh, in, in a way that men aren't, because they were the ones that would leave the village and go and leave the family, um, yeah. and go and and go to another family and go to another village. So, which again makes them much more concerned about friends. Um, and, and, and those kinds of relations. Well, it's quite interesting. I, I also put in there um, two things, pro-cooperative attributes. Uh, uh, simply from a patriarchy standpoint, you, you, know, you don't want someone who's always going to be second-guessing your decisions, your choices, whatever else, making bringing conflict and disorder into your life. I've, I've experienced this directly. Uh, someone who has no plan, who has no direction, who has no demonstrable uh, success in life, telling me, what we should and shouldn't do and i'm telling them hey that's a bad plan and it's we see it's a bad plan because your life sucks uh so pro cooperative attributes and i also spoke about um self-care you know uh, <laughs> i hold the opinion that women are very emotional creatures but that doesn't excuse a lot of what we see in relationships when women are using pms or whatever else or uh, as an excuse to uh you know act for what I can only call unhinged at times. <laughs> not always, not all women, obviously. And so the ability to self-regulate emotions. And I compared this to men and their sexuality. It's like, it's, it's difficult, but you can control it. Every man can control himself sexually. It's just easier not to. And it's the same thing in my humble social media to women, men to uh, adult entertainment. It's, it's difficult for women to control their emotional condition. It's just easier not to. And since there's very few or very little consequences societally and usually socially within their, their circle, their family, uh, because people are forgiving, because we love them, there's no consequence for actually just letting your emotions run wild uh, and unchecked, which mm. can cause a lot of relationship problems over time. So self-care, you know, um, that's a that's a, something to vet for in a woman in a relationship. There used to be consequences to it, though. So if you go back to the 17th century, women that would go around the village, letting their emotions run wild, being nasty to everybody and saying nasty things and making people upset, would be accused of being witches and would be hanged. Um, or women, or, or women that were that, 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 would, that would that would go on and on and on at their husbands, such that it was heard outside the household, would be would be have a scold's bridle put in their mouth. Uh, or would be ducked in the river, would be put in a special chair called a ducking stall, then raised up on a crane and put down in the river as a as a social punishment. For, uh, because these are small villages. People overhear arguments and whatever, and people, women that got a reputation like that, that's what would happen to them. And, but, of course, there were always consequences for men, and still are, who can't control their sexuality. Then there are, there are serious consequences, and quite right, too. But, yeah. the, but, the, but the, the social shunning the social consequences of females that fail to control uh, those kinds of emotions are as you as you as you say unless it's so extreme that they're classified as mentally ill yeah. um uh, and even then i it, it seems they're permitted to live among us i was at my local supermarket the other day there's this girl that works there a pretty young girl both her arms are a lattice work of cuts um you know th there's there's obviously something seriously wrong with her yeah. Um, and and doing that, that that kind of behavior is associated among women with histrionic but with dark triad traits basically with histrionic personality with moderately psychopathic traits it's 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 a way of uh, wanting people to take notice of you and manipulating yeah. people to do that it's um, not, and, I, I don't it's really not. Worse, and it's not it's not it's not a comfortable way to be it's not a comfortable relationship no indeed we've moved off topic somewhat but haven't we? We yeah sorry about... yeah we were just sort of talking <laughs> Uh, let's talk about children, personalizing it. So how does that look? I mean, when you look at me as a guy, Muslim guy, you know, 10 kids. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you must be you know, harsh. You must be tired. You must be tiring. <laughs> That's what this guy said. He said, you look, I look tired. <laughs> how, how, old, how old are your children? Uh, the eldest are 26, they're twins. Uh, this from the wife with six kids. The Twins, kids. God, that must have been bloody tiring. It, it was for the first children. It was um, I, actually I was very young. 
So it wasn't so bad. I had a lot of energy. I actually, my opinion is that people should have children younger because you have more energy. I see this now because I am, uh, I'm 50. I turned 51 this year. And you have more energy. You have more patience when you're young than you do if you have, you know, emotional, these current. Well, patience, on the other hand, testosterone levels go down a bit as you get older. So people become less impulsive. And also there's evidence. There's also evidence that as people get older, they become higher in agreeableness and higher in conscientiousness. These, these things go up with age and they become more mentally stable. So um, in some ways, one could argue that you would be a more nurturing and a better father the older you got based on that. Uh, you're right. You would get tired. You'd get tired more easily. You'd have this energy. Yeah. That would be the downside. One thing I was about, I was I wanted to throw in there is that you know I'm from Gen X, obviously, so we didn't have this extended adolescence. You know, um, you know, we, we didn't get to be children until we're 24, 25, 26, or whatever else. So, <laughs> or whatever the going thing is now, you know, in terms of uh, it seems to be early thirties. Yeah. I've I, I've heard cases of people that are in their early thirties. No, I moved back in with my parents for a bit to save money. Yeah, that's why I've been counting. So I, I just I just don't know where this 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 adolescence ends nowadays. So I think if the person is mature enough, because it, I'll give you an example. Of what I mean, I was in Qatar. I was a I was an English teacher there, and I, then later on I worked for the Ministry of Defense uh, as a as a language instructor. And I lived in an apartment building for a short time before I moved into a villa. And in this apartment building, there was this young girl. I mean, she was really, I, I, she couldn't have been four, maybe four at best. And that four-year-old was carrying a baby. And she was really like taking care of the child. Now, I'm not saying it's a praiseworthy thing. <laughs> it's kind of problematic because she was wandering around in the hallway, just kind of, you know, some someone just let the kid. Well, Nick, Qatari, a Qatari girl. I don't think they were Qatari. Qataris don't live in apartment buildings. Uh, nonetheless, because I was concerned, I stopped and I kind of watched. It was on my floor and I kept looking out. The child took very good care of the baby. And I was thinking, this child is more responsible than a lot of the adults that I know myself right now. So I think um, maybe depending on what society and culture you grow up in, say maybe a developing world country, uh, adolescence is not, it's, it's a luxury that uh, a well, lot yeah, of I mean, even, even, in, even, in, even in terms of the, the the concept of a teenager and i mean it existed i mean that everyone even if you go back to the 16th century they're talking about gangs of young people that, mm. are, that, that are dangerous they're difficult although it should be emphasized that because of poor nutrition and various factors um mm. people went through puberty a lot later so that, that this is the, the the it's in a sense it's one could argue it's almost like the industrial revolution and the consequent uh, in, um, improvements in health uh, based on that and improvements in uh, nutrition and so forth uh, have helped to create the, the, the notion of a teenager. Because it used to be that basically you were a child and, um, and, and puberty was quite, a, the, the process had to happen quite late and it was quite short. Uh, in Victorian England, the average girl would, would have her first period at about the age of 17, 16, something like that. Sometimes, I mean, if you, but, uh, but there was period, there was a period of time. Um, sorry, this is late Victor, um, in, uh, yeah, so high Victorian England. So people were getting, people, it was interfering with how, with how we were living. The Industrial Revolution um, at first made us less healthy. So there's this interesting phenomenon where it's called the, the mid Victorian health crisis, where if you could trace your family tree and you're English, you'll find that your ancestors that were born in the 1890s often would have died younger than your ancestors born in the 1850s. The life expectancy at 60 among those born in the 1850s was about 15 years. And we didn't get back to that until about 1979. And this was because of tinned fruit and, and uh, less exercise and all kinds of stuff that was, that was going on, the mid-Victorian health crisis. And so the, the age at which women went through puberty started to rise um, but even even so, this idea that women go through puberty, that girls go through puberty at about twelve, um, it's a, it's a, it's a relatively modern uh, thing. It used to be a lot later they'd go through it, and the boys their voices break. Often their voices wouldn't break till they were about seventeen. Um, if you if you go back in history, so so it's that's new. And then the idea that it's a it's a distinct like liminal phase. If you go back before about the fifties. People that were teenagers just dressed like everybody else. Children dressed like everybody else. They just dressed in mini adult clothes. 
Um, and, and, and now, you know, they, they dress in this distinct style, um, which they then carry on dressing in until they're in God knows how old. So it's a yeah, it's a new it's a new thing. Is this is this extended adolescence? You could argue though it's a K-oriented thing because that's what K strategy should involve, isn't it? It should be a, a strongly extended adolescence because mm -hmm. there's loads and loads to learn. Yeah, indeed. Mm. I would agree with that. So let me ask you, going back on topic, what do we do? We're Westerners. We I I I would prefer to see Western society survive. It's what I know. I'd like my children to enjoy the, the the benefits of what I've seen in Western society. Although I I do intend to introduce some artificial hardship simply so that they develop you know character and strength and all that type of stuff. But what do we do out here? What how do we? What's the what's next for us who would like to see for you have children? I have children. I thought that was a very interesting remark you just made. Artificial hardship. So a, a book I did many years ago is called Churchill's Headmaster. And it was about the prep school headmaster of Winston Churchill. And with the public school system, my public school, you know what I mean? These these uh, bo these uh, boarding schools for the elite that exist, mm -hmm. that, that, like Eton and whatever. And that's exactly what they did. They took the view that the elite can easily become decadent. They don't want for anything. They're materially wealthy. They don't really have to worry about anything. And that's no good. That's no good for people that are going to run our empire. We need people that have been inculcated with the values of the group. We need people that know what it's like to have suffered, that know what it's like to, to, to experience want, to know, to know basically a harsh yet stable system, a K system, a harsh yet stable system, as Indeed. opposed to an easy yet stable system, which is what you can experience if you're rich. And so that, and so that, system was introduced where these children at quite a young age about the age of eight the children of the english upper class were taken away from their families through this really quite brutal system of violence and 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 and, and, and whatever um and and the idea was that if you can survive that if you can then 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 you can survive life in the army for, for the empire you can survive running the empire and whatever so that was the idea to introduce artificial harshness that was the system and I noticed it very much when I was at university. I was at Durham University in the northeast of England. It's quite a posh sort of university, lots of people from public schools. And the people from public schools, you could deal with them. They were fine. They were, they were fine because they'd been they'd had arrogance and being a twat kind of beaten out of them at school. The people that were, were a problem were those that were had been to private schools, day schools, mm. where they don't board, and they'd had all the benefits of being rich and never wanting for anything or being worried about anything ever but none of the negative sides of it none of the none of the ritualistic system of the english public schools and so these people were just decadent arrogant entitled unpleasant people and so i think i think i think i think you're right about that something like that uh, would be good for the society um, in Finland, I suppose they have, or at least they used to have, a lot of Scandinavian countries still have military service. In, now, Germany, it's, it's in Germany, but I think there is an option now, in Finland there is at least, where you can do a thing called civili palvilus, which is that if you don't want to do the military service, you can just like go and help out in a kindergarten for a year or something degrading like that. Um, and, then, and, then, and then you don't, so no, a compuls, something like compulsory military service, where you are inculcated with group-oriented values and with hardship um, could potentially be a, a good thing for this is, and confronted with death or fear of death would um, would would perhaps be something that would be a, a thing to think about. It sounds. I mean, but <laughs> I think trying to introduce that in the Western society on a whole is probably going to be quite difficult. Well, uh, no, we're too we're too individually oriented, so it's it's so hard. It's so yeah. to do anything that's for the good of the group. The very idea we're in this, even with COVID, that clearly the thing to do was hurt was herd immunity, and yeah. but we couldn't bring ourselves to do it. So you have this crazy system which we will be which we will regret for a hundred years, yeah. of more of, of locking down the economy, oh. of creating inflation, of 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 of. of uh, just such a terrible idea, but th and that's what they did. My well, wife asked a question, but is it worth trying to survive in the West, or should we just make an exit plan? We kind of talked about this with Dubai. Yeah, I think yeah. I think I think that you will see this gradually happening. So you you will see um, 
more uh, as Western countries become stupider and stupider and more and more chaotic and more and more left wing, then gradually people that are intelligent and conservative, i.e. The, the breeders and the, the, the people that have a sense of eternity, the people that have a sense of their own eternal importance, um, mm. the people that basically believe in God to some extent or at least something like that. Um, those people will gradually, and they're finding each other. The internet allows them to find each other for a start. It is beautiful. Um, the, the, those people will, and so you're getting this balkanization already. You know, one fascinating thing is that among generation, generation Z are not as left-wing as they should be. They're the most woke left-wing generation ever. But a, a, a generation should be predictably more left-wing than the preceding generation. That's how it's been going for a long time, right? So they should be they should be a certain degree more left-wing than people that are forty. These people that are twenty, but they're not. Yeah. They're too. They're not left-wing enough. And the reason for that is ultimately because of a right-wing backlash among people that young. It's balkanization among a polarization among people that young. that's happening, and so those kinds of people are going to, I think gradually slowly congregate together uh, and, and find ways of creating their own what i call neo-byzantiums or whatever um in various places um uh, uh, parts of countries uh areas of countries that will become increasingly fragmented we already have that in the uk you have parts of northern england that are de facto muslim microstates basically and people that live there they, they don't leave and people that are not from there don't go in and it, they're just sort of de facto separate states. And you'll, you'll, you'll get this balkanization in the winter of civilization, and this is what you'll get. And part of that will be these people that are intelligent, but also are um, probably a relatively conservative, group-oriented uh, sort of value. Interesting, interesting. I like the sound of that. You know, I've been talking about tribe building, online tribe building, meeting, uh, meeting your tribe online and then meeting offline uh, for quite some time now. I actually made a Discord to try and build it, but, you know, it's... it's uh, it's it's much more difficult uh, in practicality than, as opposed to theory. Theory and practicality are two different things, obviously. So um, yeah, I, I I like the sound of that though. I it sounds correct. I, I when it comes to I got caught up. Just a quick history, real quick. We're up on an hour, so we're gonna close, we're gonna shut this down here. But I, I entered into the entire Twitter sphere in this uh, I guess what you call the red pill. You know, red pill everything because they were dealing with you know men's issues, relationships, all this type of stuff. And at the time, like I said, I was looking for help uh, because I was having problems with my relationships when I came out of my marriage after my divorce, and so I was looking for answers uh, because it's not my model to just marry, divorce, marry, divorce, marry, divorce. So it was bothering me that that was happening to me. So anyway, I come into the circle and I noticed that like there's there's these clear lines that, not clear lines, but these shady lines, and the closer you look, it's sort of like squinting, the clearer they become. So from a distance, they look fuzzy, but when you really look closely, they're very clear lines. And I called quite some time ago uh, that, you know, we're going to see a fraction, you know, fractioning of groups online. I just didn't realize that this was something that was happening on a, on a greater societal level uh, until recently, which has uh, changed my stance on a lot of things. Which I mentioned earlier about being a Muslim, having a strong in-group preference for Muslims, but at the same time, not all Muslims, unfortunately. Uh, so no, it's fascinating. You should you should uh, you're fifty or nearly fifty. You said you should you should talk to some people in their early twenties. Um, it's 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 fascinating. Well, you presumably perhaps you have children that are that age, but it's it's fa it's fascinating to see this fracturing that's happening among them. And then yeah. once the groups start fracturing, then you get a sort of competitive signaling. And so they become more and more extreme. Um, and, and so there's some, there's some really interesting stuff happening on the ground. That's my, um, well, that, that's both what the data says and it's in my personal experience. Sir, it has been a great pleasure to have you on. Uh, <laughs> I, I hope I was a good host. You were definitely a great guest. Uh, no, it was very, very interesting to talk to you. Thank you. I would definitely like to talk to you about like population collapse. This is something that I'm very interested in. I've been looking at population collapse in China, in the West, and the the the, the consequences. Well, Korea, <laughs> South Korea is the main one. Point eight fertility. Okay. I mean, Korea is just dying. It's going to be gone within a few generations. There'll be no people living in South Korea. Point eight fertility. I'm interested in having a conversation on another show, if you would. Uh, it's something new to me, and so it, for me, it's definitely very deep learned. Uh, but I'm looking into it right now, uh, and I find it very interesting the entire topic because I think that's going to have like huge consequences for my children. So 
I like I don't know if it's possible to prepare someone for something like this, but I would definitely like you know because I teach my children, so I'd like them to at least have the ability to you know build mental models in their mind of like what possibilities are and how they can react to certain situations in the future. So if you would have that conversation with me, I would like to in the future. So. Let's let's do that sometime. Let's do that sometime. Yeah. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Same. Thank you. All right, everybody. We will see you on the next live show. Uh, I hope Jesus is coming on next.